uh, to the average modern believer today and are not available in very much better condition than the sacred writings of most other great peoples. In other words, he takes the attitude that there is a peculiar and strange dark curtain that has fallen over all religions. That this curtain fell at some undetermined date. And he likes to symbolize it by the fact that each religion of the world passes through the experience of losing the key to its own doctrine. That this key becomes lost. The books don't become lost. The descent of the hierarchs, the uh, priests and the uh, teachers, this descent does not seemingly cease. But there seems to be a point in all the religions of men where certainty fades away and where in the place of certainty man falls into opinion and in the place of assurance of things he falls into interpretation about which there is an endless divergence of opinion and Pike takes the point that wherever there is a tremendous division of opinion there is a poverty of fact because we are not divided on any matter in which we are certain. We are divided by our uncertainties, particularly in matters of religion and philosophy. And if the primordial religion of man was available in its original pristine beauty, Pike takes the ground that probably no one would resent it or oppose it. But that all down through time, there has been a falling away from the power of exactitude and that in this great drift of ages marked by the destruction of ancient works uh, by the uh, scattering of peoples uh, by the gradual uh, interchange of racial beliefs and doctrines that the purities of the lines of descent of tradition have gradually been corrupted so that today as he expresses it in his own words religion has gradually moved into the position of a powerful in ethical a powerful ethical structure of believing and that religion today is measured by the individual's acceptances of certain things as true the acceptances of certain ethical codes about which there seems to be less division of opinion than upon more abstract theological questions. Thus men still are more or less agreed as to the nature of honesty, but they are not at the moment in very solid agreement as to the nature of first cause or any of these great abstractions which um, mark the foundations or beginnings of practically all of the world's faiths. Thus Pike takes the attitude that there is a key which opens the structure of these ancient teachings and that this key is lost. If not lost, it is unfortunately mislaid. It is not available to us when we most need it and most want it. And in the place of this key, men have fashioned many keys and some of them seem to fit fairly well. But it was Pike's opinion that these keys did not actually turn the lock correctly that they did, make, did not make available the point uh, which is of the greatest basic interest or the greatest basic value. Pike then points out that his assumption is based upon a number of, of points which he considers to be highly relevant. He sees in a certain central area involving uh, the great complex of Persian Aryan peoples a center from which radiating outward in almost all directions streams of culture flowed like rivers of life uh, to make fertile the religions and cultures of a great many peoples. He is convinced from his study of ancient languages and ancient teachings that there are vestiges, evidences, fragments, perpetuations of this ancient Iranian faith to be found in almost all of the surviving religions of the world. 
He believes also that to a great degree many of these faiths are the direct outgrowth of ideas and teachings which have apparently vanished in their own homeland, that they are no longer available in the place where they came from, and that by degrees they have moved away into these other groups. But Pike points out, if all of these other groups hold certain doctrines, ideas, or principles in common, and all these groups have a certain dependency, which is obvious in their ritualism, obvious in their symbolism, obvious even in their languages, then the various productions which arise as the result of this central force must have within themselves some more than incidental borrowings, some more than incidental fragments of the original teaching. Thus Pike, beginning, for example, by studying the Kabbalah and uh, the, uh, the ancient writings in the Valley of the Euphrates, moving into Hinduism and Buddhism, going down into Egyptian philosophy and finally over into Greek philosophy, particularly the Orphic and Pythagorean schools, he finds in all of these groups indications that a tradition of some kind, a tradition no longer directly available, even in the Persian religion, came from Persia or came from that general area and that this tradition carried to a dozen other localities has survived in all of these localities. Therefore, at least potentially, it must be assumed that they were also in the original locality which was the source of these migratory uh, procedures. Pike then, in his researches, was seeking for the evidence of what he regarded as the essential principles of the wisdom religion. He was convinced that when he refers to the wisdom religion, he is referring to something that had a valid existence. He is not merely speaking in his thinking of an abstract symbolic term. He is thinking that uh, there was, at a remote time, a highly organized faith, a more or less complete or total structure of religious insight, that this religious insight was not theological primarily, but completely philosophical and scientific. In other words, he is probing for what the alchemists in the Middle Ages called the exact science of human salvation. He believes that such a science existed, that this science was just exactly as orderly and inevitable as mathematics, and that the regeneration of man is a process for which there is an exact methodology, that this methodology underlies uh, the so-called claims, or to some people pretensions, of ancient peoples to possess this knowledge. And Pike is convinced that men of the caliber of Socrates and of Plato and of Pythagoras and many others in other parts of the world could not have been deceived in this matter. That these men were aware that religion divides into two distinct parts. That the core of it, the essential part of it, is this sacred science, which he calls the wisdom religion, and that the second part of it was the sacerdotal art, or the theological aspect, which had as its perhaps its prominent and most important function that of the ethical development of man. Pike therefore goes on to take the position that it was the purpose of this twofold structure to continue to bring to the attention of men, of mortal persons, the tremendous need for the enlightenment, improvement, and perfection of themselves, that the outer part of this, or the exoteric body of religion, 
consisted of a great group of moral, ethical virtues. Virtues founded in purification, consecration, devotion. And that the individual who accomplished to a great degree these matters was entitled, as he points out in the early Persian lore, to seek and find one of the holy teachers, the good ones, who could show him the way to that which was locked behind uh, the veil of the inner teaching. Thus, the virtues constituted the probationary part of religion. That the living of the good life, the thinking of the good thought, this, uh, these qualities made man ready to know because by means of these qualities man claimed the moral birthright of his own humanity. Man stood up then and said, I am worthy. I have proved my worthiness. But Pike does not believe that religion ends in the proof of worthiness. This is important. It is the beginning but that the good man is not the complete and total purpose of religion. That the purpose of religion is that it shall take over in some mysterious way the good man and make him the truly wise man. And that the wise man in this case is the individual who has received the secrets of the divine life the secret of the release of his own godhood and the secret of the means by which he will ultimately be restored to unity with the total divinity of life and space. That this has to be an exact process. That hoping, believing will help. But that just as hoping and believing will not allow an inexperienced man to perform a delicate piece of surgery or even a great and devout uh, believing will enable a man who has never played the piano to become inst instantly a musician. So hope and believing are not in themselves substitutes for actual knowledge. That they are the moral forces by which man is sustained in his search for knowledge. But that this knowledge stands apart stands like some strange mysterious sphinx upon the desert of waiting and that this sphinx, locking within itself the secret of man's divine birthright, that this sphinx must be questioned by a knowing Oedipus who is able to take from the sphinx the secret of its riddle and thus end forever the mystery with which truth is shrouded. To attain this purpose then, Pike begins to search what he calls the monuments of time to discover whether his position is valid. In his work on the uh, Indo-Aryans that we have just mentioned, Pike says in the preface that this monograph was never intended for publication. It represented only his own research, and it was not published until many years after his death. It was simply the record, the daily record of his own searching. It was the step-by-step -step unfoldment of his own purpose. And he said many steps had to be retraced and taken over again. And that he had to discard along the way many of the most uh, attractive so-called discoveries that he had made. And he insists in this preface also that as a lawyer, as a thinker, as a man of training, he did not reason from a conclusion. He tried to reason toward one keeping his mind open to negation even to the end, willing to accept any absolute truth or complete fact even though it swept away the entire work that he had accomplished. His purpose was, if possible, uh, to reveal what he felt might be there, but which he could not accept until he had subjected it to the most careful analysis. But at the end of his writing, he tells us that he was fortified in his hope and that although much vanished along the way and he was forced to break with many authorities long held as uh, almost sacred, 
he came finally to the conclusion that the evidence in favor of the original concept was irrefutable and that this evidence perhaps is nowhere as obvious as it is in this circle this uh, uh, diameter of the wheel in which the various nations of the world all indicate that they shared with him this absolute conviction that there was a universal knowing a universal wisdom reality and that this universal wisdom reality was certainly a far greater antiquity than we are normally inclined to suspect searching further in this field Pike's felt conclusively necessary that we begin to push back the historical boundaries of what we term the era of light instead of assuming that light came to this world 3,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago or that man became a sapient creature 5,000, 6,000, 10,000 years ago that we have to begin to push back this search for the origin of the enlightened man actually it was Pike's conviction that man as man was created or fashioned or came into existence whether by evolutionary or other processes that the human being from the beginning possessed the instinct of intelligence that this instinct of intelligence gradually developing over a great period of time accomplished far more in its so-called early phases than we are inclined to, exp to suspect. Pike rejects actually and completely the emergence of an enlightened man seven or eight thousand years ago. Even though we cannot by means of any existing historical record discover the rational pre-Egyptian, uh, the rational pre-Greek, the, pr the rational uh, pre-Semite. Pike insists that this being existed or that these beings existed and that actually the streams of our tradition are far older than we suspect and what we call history is nothing but the record of the decline of truth now the reason why it is a record of the decline of truth is that it like the history of a man is a long unfolding record of his death because that part of his history which is concerned primarily with his life actually occurs before he is born in his prenatal period man is growing from the moment he is born he is dying the moment birth takes over the forces of crystallization begin to set in and in this process of gradual dying man passes through varying degrees of death process when he achieves what we call maturity he has come to the fine point of the equilibrium between life and death in that period therefore we regard him as having a maximum maturity and a maximum efficiency but what do we mean we mean that by the time he is 35 to 45 years of age he has reached the point where his materiality is becoming established and his spirituality is already three quarters dead we are coming to the point where through compromise of principles he is making economic progress that is satisfactory he has already died out of something he has died out of the dreams of youth he has died out of a great many hopes he is becoming factual which is another term for crystallized therefore the history of our peoples the history of the world as we know it is the gradual process of man dying now it cannot be a total picture because men are forever being born but a moment an institution a system an ideological structure comes into existence that moment it begins to die so we have the long record of things fading away 
And the things that fade first are the memories, apparently, of old things, of first things. Because in the struggle of life, we forget the dreams of youth. So by degrees, we reintegrate or reorganize our concepts, becoming ever more practical, ever more factual, discarding as lore, legend, and fairy tale things that were once the real values of our lives. Thus we have at the root of history, legendary and lore, golden ages and mysterious heavenly abodes. And as we got wiser and wiser, which means in this case deader and deader, we began to forget these things and lose them. First thing you know, we began to say these legends are for children. But children are the young, children are the alive. Therefore there is an aliveness gradually fading away. And Pike makes a long and careful study of this aliveness. He makes a very painstaking research to show why and how each generation has persecuted the prophets. How each generation has little by little revised and restored and reinterpreted and reintegrated and every time it did it something was lost. Until finally, great things were reduced to 